welcome to the Right Take Podcast, news, ideas, and conversations at the intersection of politics and culture, a project of the David Horowitz Freedom Center. I will be your host, Mark Tapson. Welcome again to the Right Take Podcast with Mark Tapson. Thanks for joining me. Well, if you are a conservative who keeps up with pop culture to any extent, especially if you keep up with the conservative news site Breitbart.com, then you can't have failed to notice the controversy surrounding the release of a feature film being distributed by Breitbart called My Son Hunter, a political satire about Joe Biden's wayward son and his laptop from hell. Perhaps you've even seen the movie online, and I hope you have or plan to for a couple of reasons. First, for conservative audiences who have turned their back on the entertainment industry because they're tired of leftist Hollywood sucker punching them with movies laced with woke messaging or anti-conservative bigotry, My Son Hunter is a breath of fresh air and highly entertaining. Second, by watching the film, you're supporting the kind of counter-cultural filmmaking that America so desperately needs. And by that, I mean that the left dominates the culture now, so the left is the establishment. And a film that runs against the progressive worldview, against that grain, is counterculture, which means that the right is actually in the position of sticking it to the man. And I think there's an audience of many millions of Americans who are are hungry for that kind of filmmaking and storytelling. I reviewed My Son Hunter for FrontPageMag.com, and I gave it a big thumbs up. Do I think My Son Hunter is a great film? One of the epic cinematic achievements like Citizen Kane or The Godfather or John Wick? No. Do I think, as I wrote in my review, that it raises the bar creatively for quote-unquote conservative filmmaking? Yes. Yes, I do. And that begs the question, well, what is conservative filmmaking? Shouldn't it be just filmmaking? Why attach the political label conservative to it? And the answer is a most emphatic yes, we should be making just great entertainment that comes without that labeling. But with My Son Hunter, there's obviously a political context to the story that's inevitably going to mean that it gets labeled as a conservative film. And that's an issue that I'll be discussing with my guest at The Right Take today, who happens to be the screenwriter of My Son Hunter. So we'll get to him and discussing that in a bit. You have never seen a conservative film quite like this, is what I wrote in my review. My Son Hunter is directed by veteran conservative actor Robert Davi and produced by veteran conservative producers Fela McAleer and Anne McElhaney, who are well known, probably best known for the documentary Frack Nation and also Gosnell, the um, feature film about the serial killer abortionist. And was written, My Son Hunter, that is, was written by screenwriter Brian Gadawa, probably best known for his film To End All Wars, and also his work on the Obamagate movie, which was another film by uh, Fella McAleer and Anne McElhaney. My Son Hunter veers from comedy to tragedy, from family drama to high-level political corruption, from moral brokenness to moral courage. And just like Hunter's life, there is an almost nonstop parade of hookers, drugs, and shady deals. One viewer at a private screening described the film as not your mother's conservative movie. And I think that's true. If you don't know, the plot centers on Hunter Biden, of course, played by British actor Lawrence Fox, who has appeared in Gosford Park, Elizabeth the Golden Age, uh, the Frankenstein Chronicles, and and Hunter's terrified realization that the personal laptop he carelessly forgot to pick up from a repair shop could derail his father's presidential campaign. Hunter has also fallen in love in the film with a hooker who offers to help him spin the bad publicity for the laptop. But in order to do that, she needs to know all the potentially damaging material on that computer. And as the sordid contents come to light and reveal the depth and breadth of Biden family corruption, the hooker undergoes a slow political revelation. But the emotional core of the film, and the most interesting part to me, is the strained relationship between needy, hapless Hunter, who craves his father's love and respect, and resentful Joe Biden, played by John James, who is best known for roles in 80s television like Dynasty. The two give, in my opinion, outstanding performances. Fox is an accomplished actor, 
who also happens to be an outspoken champion of free speech and anti-wokeness. And James manages to convey the Elder Biden's emotional coldness, his creepiness uh, and corruption and encroaching dementia, all without once going over the top, which must have been a real temptation for an actor. Their interaction, by that I mean uh, <clears throat> John James and um, Lawrence Fox, their interaction makes for the most compelling moments in the film, both the comic and the tragic. Reviews, predictably, have been split along ideological lines. The left-dominated film uh, reviewers hate it, and the few conservative alternatives love it. Uh, Hot Air called it a fun, irreverent romp. Movie Guide called it extremely well-directed, written and acted, with some crazy funny moments and high drama. Uh, at the far-left Daily Beast, an otherwise dismissive review admitted that My Son Hunter is, quote, probably the best conservative movie to emerge from the right-wing media in recent memory, unquote. And a reviewer at Britain's left wing, The Independent, actually trashed the movie, but grudgingly conceded that several times the film had him rushing to Google, where he discovered that this or that piece of unflattering Biden trivia were, uh, was in fact rooted in truth. Do tell. But reviewers' political bias aside, My Son Hunter manages to be, as I said, both wildly entertaining and deeply affecting, sometimes in the same scene. And I think you can largely credit Lawrence Fox's extraordinary performance for that, and also Brian Gadawa's humanizing screenwriting, which we will get to uh, momentarily when I have him on later in the show. While he was discussing the film on Tucker Carlson tonight, Lawrence Fox said, and I think this is interesting, quote, back in the day, this film would have been made by Oliver Stone. It wouldn't have been down to small independent filmmakers to make it. Hollywood would have lapped it up. It shows how badly Hollywood has been corrupted by the woke ideology that they won't go anywhere near this, unquote. And that is why conservatives need more films like My Son Hunter. In fact, that is why America needs more films like it. And to dig deeper into that, let me now bring on the Right Takes guest today. But let me remind you first that to keep up with the conversations we're having here at the intersection of politics and culture, please subscribe to The Right Take on the platform of your choice, including Spotify and Apple Podcasts, or wherever fine podcasts are heard. Brian Gadawa is an award-winning screenwriter and filmmaker, best known until now with My Son Hunter for the movie To End All Wars with Kiefer Sutherland and Robert Carlyle. He's a best-selling author also of biblical novels, including his Chronicles series, Chronicles of the Nephilim, Chronicles of the Watchers, and Chronicles of the Apocalypse. He's a lecturer and scholar and author of nonfiction as well. His book, Hollywood Worldviews, Watching Films with Wisdom and Discernment, is used as a textbook in schools around the country. He can speak about storytelling more insightfully than anyone I know, and he also happens to be a close friend of mine for many years, I'm honored to say. Brian Gadawa, welcome to the Right Take podcast. Hey, thanks for having me on, Mark. It's an honor to be on the Right Take. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm really happy uh, that you joined us. I think this is going to be a great conversation. Um, let's just jump right into talking about my son, Hunter, at first, and then uh, we'll broaden, broaden our scope a little bit. I noticed that as of this morning, September 20th, um, if you go to Rotten Tomatoes, the film review site, My Son Hunter has an audience score of 92%. And it has so few reviews that I guess it didn't, did not rate a tomato meter. Um, I, it's, it, apparently there are two reviews there, both of which are kind of predictably negative. But the interesting thing to me here is that um, the left didn't so much as as review my son Hunter as ignore it, and by, by the left I mean you know the left dominated entertainment media. It's it's more like they uh, preferred to ignore my son Hunter than to actually than to even give it a bad review. What what do you make about that that disconnect there between the audience score and and just virtually uh, being ignored by the mainstream? film media. Yeah. 
No, yeah, you're right, Don. That's one of the two major tactics is um, one is to mock endless mockery um, because mockery just deadens something. Or if something very effective or very influential um, in a different way, like quality or something, then they will ignore it. And of course, you know, this is what this is what they do with all the the news that they want to suppress, right? They just ignore it like Hunter Biden's laptop when it first came out, right? They suppress it. They just don't want the information out. So that's actually a good sign to me when you have the of course, um others have had a higher gap difference. Um I believe uh Dinesh D'Souza's 2000 Mules has a 100% on the audience level and a 0% on the critics. So they they did us better. Um but yeah, the wider the gap, the the better the movie is because um, you know critics are just fools and you know they're leftists and I I, I would much rather I'm whenever if I ever go to the Rotten Tomatoes is always to find out what the audience um, what their ratings are because those are the most ac- the, the most accurate in the sense of you know quality and and uh, whether or not the movie's good. So, um, but it's interesting because the the other side of that coin is the. Uh, Attacks and so when when the movie uh, came out, um, you know there they did get it did get some reviews on some of the key left wing you know like I think the Guardian came out first the the English papers came out first I think and uh, you know Gawker and Vox and some of these um, you know uh, propaganda outlets for leftism but they you know they they tend to also mock it in fact what what was really funny was that uh, the um i think it was the independent one of these um they did a review of the movie and they had not seen the movie and it was like 3000 words and it's like and now to to be fair they watched the trailer and then they tried to extrapolate from that of course you can't extrapolate from a trailer and you know yeah, a trailer does try to show the vibe of the movie a little bit, you know, but it's like they just use that as a jumping point uh, or a diving board for their own uh, projection of their own um, sort of hatred and and bile and and um, you know bitterness. Um, in fact, it was so it was so bad that the the I mean, this guy was just pouring, heaping invective upon invective. And I, I almost wanted to sit down and like get a scorecard of all the all the extremist words that they try to. You know, it's like they have this list of extremist words, you know, like white supremacy, um, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, conspiracy theories, hoaxes. You know, they make sure they use every single invective that that they can against you. It has nothing to do with with what you with the actual project, you know. And um, that's how he was writing, and it was just after about halfway through, it was so boring. This guy was just spewing his own, like I say, he, that's what I find most of these, these hate reviews are. They're projections of their own um, violent hatred and bigotry. And so um, that's how they, f- that's how they try to attack something to destroy it. You know, in fact, I think there was a couple different places where online where they uh someone watched the whole movie and they would just a- attack the whole movie you know so uh, like i say though honestly i i really do th- those are very encouraging to me because that that says that our product our film is effective and they know it and they hate that so they have to tear it down if it wasn't good how did you get involved in it to begin with my son hunter well um I've been working with Ann and Phelan, um, uh, Ann McElhaney and uh, Phelan McAleer. Um, <laughs> I'm laughing because we've been talking about how uh, the media and different people mis, mis- say our names, you know, <laughs> and their names are kind of hard. And my name is too. I don't, you know, it's it, it, whatever. But so anyway, I, I've known Ann and Phelan for a few years and and I've worked with them on other projects. There was... Um, one project that uh, called Obama Gate, which was like a play, and um, a Phelan had already sort of written the play, but he wanted me he he wanted me to come in and help rewrite it, and it became Obama Gate. And you can see that for free on YouTube, and it's basically the actual texts between the two FBI agents who were trying to take down Trump. Um, there and they were also having an adulterous affair, and all we did was we just re- we just had them recite the literal. Um, 
texts, you know, as the dialogue of, of, and you'd think, oh, that could get boring, but no, it was really funny and fascinating. Anyway, I helped him on that project and we've been, you know, I've, I've been around waiting for something that I can work on. You know, I missed the Gosnell movie. And, uh, so he came to me and, um, they basically just called up, uh, shortly after the election 2020 and just said that was right when the Hunter Biden laptop was, uh, how shall I say the news of it was starting to come out, but it was being, obviously it was being suppressed, you know, by Twitter and Facebook and everything. But if, you know, those of us who are in the uh, alternative media, we, we found out about it. So anyway, we knew this was a big topic. And so they, they just called me up and said, we want to do a movie on Hunter Biden's laptop and we don't want it to be a documentary. So Ann and Phelan have done some great documentaries. Frack Nation is, is one of my favorite. That's what I, how I was introduced to them. I, I saw Frack Nation and I, I met with, uh, with, Phelan. And, um, so, uh, but it's like, what do we do? You know? And it was, it was, it was a tough one because from what little I even just knew at the time and, and, you know, books like Miranda Devine's book hasn't come out, hadn't come out yet, you know? So, and she wrote the book laptop from hell, which was a, one of the best distillation of the, the emails on the laptop. Right. But it, it, that hadn't come out yet, you know, and Peter Schweitzer had some material out there and stuff, but a lot of it was just New York Post articles and other articles of the f- couple places who covered it. And I, re- I already recognized, you know, there's so much detail and it's such a complex, you know, these, these financial crimes that these, you know, political monsters engage in, of course they cover their tracks and all that. So it's, it's a very complex situation. And just from what little I knew, you know, the connections with the Ukraine and with China it was like, oh my gosh, this is complex. How can we make this entertaining, you know? And because we wanted to, they wanted to make a feature film, not a documentary. And so I thought, well, you know, what would be, what would be the kind of format that I could tell a story like this where I could convey a lot of information, um, but also keep it dramatic and, and hopefully humorous because we, we knew that there was a lot of irony in there. Right. And I thought, well, it's a satire. You know, I remember the movie short, um, the big short, which was fantastic movie describing the, the detailed, um, the details of the housing crisis, you know, and, and that very complex and how they shorted and all that kind of stuff. And they did it really well that way. And so by doing a satire and one where you're breaking the fourth wall, the narrator can talk to the audience. It allows you to jump space and time dramatically and allows you to, to uh, quickly deal with content and de- uh, uh, you know, facts in a way that you can skip and keep moving. If you're doing a straight dramatic uh, drama or something like that, right? You know, you've got to show the chronological progression of events or in some way, right? You have to, you have to show the, you have to show what happens for them to learn. But there's so much stuff that we had to jump around a lot. And that, that format of the political satire allowed us to do that. And so that's, that's what, that's why I came up with it. I thought that's the way to do it. Then the second way in was, you know, what, we want to make inter- entertaining movies. Um, and this isn't, you know, and by the way, the Ann and Phelan also told me, you know, that we, this isn't a hit piece. They don't, we don't want to, of course, there's a lot of criminality and a lot of stuff we have to address, you know, with Hunter and his drug addictions and stuff, but they're like, and, and Joe Biden with his mental incapacity, but they're like, we don't want to mock them and we are not out to demonize them. Right. They're human beings. And, and I thought, you know what, when I, when I read a little bit about Hunter and his life, I realized, you know what, as, as depraved as this guy is, he's got family issues. He wants to be loved and approved of, you know, he's got his addictions show a a personality that is, is hungry for meaning or significance in some way. So I thought that there was a very human story here and they, they agreed and we wanted to deal with the laptop, but we also wanted to bring out the, the, the uh, personal issues in Hunter um, re- related to his relationship with his father and his dead brother, Bo, because when, you know, when you look into that, you realize that that was a very, also a very, a triad of, of, um, complex relationships to say the least, you know? So we were excited actually about that human side. And since the movie has been released, I've heard from a lot of people, even left-wingers, they'll watch the movie and they'll go, they'll say, Oh, 
they they try to counter, make Hunter look bad, but you actually kind of feel sorry for the guy, and you really he's really humanized, and I think that must be an accident. They're, these people like they have no idea like about humanity. They assume because they would demonize someone, then that we would demonize them, right? And it's like, no, no, that was our intent to humanize them. We don't believe anybody. Every we don't believe that people are Hitler, right? You, the left believes we're Hitler, and they're delusional but we don't believe that and so i think that's been a real strength of the story is that we really dealt a lot with his humanity without you know obviously with uh without um we contextualized it okay so you still have all his crimes you still have his depravity his addictions to sex and drugs and everything it's very very out there very strong um but it just shows you yeah hey this is human and this is real so that was kind of the launching point you you totally anticipated my question about writing it as a political satire or a drama. Uh, you know, I was going to ask, could it have been written as a drama instead? But political satire, well, first let me say that um, it, it is political satire or dark comedy. But at the same time, as I mentioned in my review, which I wrote for Front Page Mag, uh, there are laugh out loud moments, but also some moments of really uh, uh, affecting drama, which I think is kind of unexpected. I think it's a, a a brilliant mix that kind of keeps you off guard in terms of its tone. By the way, um, just to throw out there, that, that was the other inspiration for me writing it was House of Cards. You know, House of Cards is a dark political satire and there's a lot of, there's murder and stuff in it, right? Um, but it's got that satirical element to it as well, as well as Wolf of Wall Street. Those were all sort of, you know, um, uh, paradigms of how to deal with serious material, but also have a, a, a dark, funny edge to it. As you did with the movie Obama Gate, did you? How, what was your decision in terms of using actual dialogue, like dialogue based on real transcripts or or from other sources? Um, how much of of you know, the, you know, the Hollywood left likes to rewrite history all the time when they make films. But when conservatives take on a project that's that's based on a true story or an historical event, the left tries to delegitimize it by saying that parts of the film were made up or that some some of the dialogue was made up as if that completely invalidates uh, everything in the film. So how much of my son Hunter was, quote unquote, made up and how much uh, how closely did you try to adhere to? actual dialogue and actual facts. Um, both Ann and Phelan have their journalism background, so they like to do verbatim as much as possible. But of course, you know, they know the difference between, you know, a, a feature movie like this versus a verbatim play. But they have that bias, but so do I. I like drawing from real sources and, and such, and as long as you can do it without, you know, lawsuits and stuff, plagiarism or whatever, I don't know. But um, so my goal was, well, by the way, uh, you know, my, my uh, sort of homage to the Coen brothers is the movie, everybody knows it already because it's already in the trailer too, where the line is that um, this is not a true story except for all the facts. And at first was, I was mm-hmm. thinking of a clever way to do that, to say that, and I came up with that. But the more I realized it, like, it's actually really true and, and uh, it is, it is kind of humorous, but it is totally true because... I wanted to come up with a, the fictional story was, um, you know, okay, we know, I, I, I knew a little bit about Hunter and all these relationships with strippers he would have. He'd have all these Coke binges and he'd have favorite stripper joints. He made one, um, he, he had a child with one stripper to, who to this day, the, the Biden family denies, does, will, will not admit, um, and so he's fallen in love with these these girls, you know, and stuff. And so, mm-hmm. to me, that that was the Hollywood interest, you know, this you know, sex and drugs and rock and roll kind of interest. People are drawn to that. I thought, okay, well, you know, uh, the laptop. So the when did the laptop start becoming a problem? December twenty nineteen. So I thought, well, what if you know, what if we the the sort of origin of the story is that when the laptop, you know, um, first when they find out that the FBI was given the laptop, you know, 
And that becomes the problem, right? <clears throat> and I thought, well, what would what would Hunter do? Well, he's an addict, so he would go on a dr- drug binge and and probably see one of his strippers, you know. And so I thought, well, what if um, since that's that's a fictional story, so we came up with a stripper who he kind of falls in love with, and he and he reveals to her what's on the laptop. And so the story actually is originally told through the eyes of that stripper, whose name is Grace. She's like a you know twenty three year old um, liberal who's stripping to, in order to pay her way through college type of thing. And, and, um, and she, so she's very, she's very much of a, a Democrat or whatever. She's on his side. She doesn't know who he is though. Right. But so when he falls in love with her, <laughs> you know, instantly, um, then he, she becomes sort of a, a confessional, sort of a priest in a way. Right. You know, it's like, what's, you know, who are you? And then, and then what's on that laptop, you know? And then she, she tries to help him craft a narrative, um, as he tells her what's on the laptop. And then, then Joe Biden comes in in a in a car and s- to find out what's going on, what's on that laptop, Hunter. So that's the fictional premise that's rooted in the real kind of things that he did, right? Uh, but it's yeah. fictional. Yes. But then that's the portal or the doorway for us to be able to then reveal what's on the laptop, and then those are the facts. Then we we sort of tell the story of the Ukraine and China connections and various other things, as well as his his dalliances with partying and drugs and all that kind of stuff. So that that was the fictional doorway, but even that was rooted in the kinds of li- kind of lifestyle he really lived. Um, and then the the facts were, you know, we we had to double check them, triple check them. Uh, so, and for legal purposes, get a couple sources on the on the key facts, you know, that we were that we were talking about. But of course, the you know the biggest fact of all is that Joe Biden was in on it, right? And and of course, that's the that's the one thing that they deny more than anything. And so we kind of show this story shows how he was in on it in in that way. So, um, yeah, and uh, and of course, even when we're dealing with the facts, though, again, this is a satire. So how do you how do you, for example, how would you communicate that he made? Um, you know, like six or seven different deals with major Chinese communist corporations. One was involved in nuclear. One was involved in the Navy. One was involved in raw materials that, you know, that are, are used in, in uh, dangerous weaponizations and stuff. H- how would you make that interesting? Well, you know, we, we kind of combine it all into one scene where it's, he's sort of telling the story to the girl and we're seeing a uh, sort of a, uh, a, a, a Senate Live skit version of it. You know what I'm saying? So we show each of the guys signing the contracts one after another, boom, 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 you know, and then he's explaining what, what they are. So those are the, those are the ways you deal with facts, but you, you communicate them in a, in a creative sort of way. You know, in my review, let's talk, let's talk about it as a quote unquote, a conservative movie. In my review, I referred to My Son Hunter as a conservative movie. And I talked about conservative filmmaking largely because in this case, anyway, the film is a political satire, so it's it's inevitably political and you know conservative or liberal. And this one skewers the left, so it is a conservative movie targeting a conservative audience in that sense. But but in general, is there a problem with that for filmmakers to set out to make a quote unquote conservative movie um, as opposed to just be writing a good movie, if I can make that distinction for the broad, for the broadest possible audience. Well, yeah, that's, that's an interesting debate. Yeah, That's the big question. It is it? because, you know, y- you have to categorize movies in order to market effectively to audiences. Uh, I'm a conservative and a film are conservatives. The director, Robert Davey, he's a conservative and he brought, as a director, he also brings um, a lot of visual and a lot of other interpretive elements to the story. And, and we worked together a little bit on the script to, to make him happy and bring in some of his ideas. And so, um, uh, but, but the truth is, is no, it, this is just a great story. And I'm serious. I mean, like, it, it is. It's like Hunter Biden's a sex addict and a drug addict, and he loves strip, falls in love with strippers, and he literally leaves his laptop, and and it becomes an FBI issue, and then the whole news world covers it up, and everyone denies it. It's like that's a. Fa- I don't care if Biden was a Republican. It, it, that's a fascinating story, and you know, I you know, you could rattle off the dozen of other movies like Vice about Dick Cheney and Game Changer about or Game Change or whatever about Sarah Palin. You know, those movies are far left wing 
mockeries of the right, but they, why don't they get labeled that? Well, because they're made in Hollywood. They got the big stars and all the money. And so they just promote, they, you know, they, they, they mask over it, you know? And, but the truth is, is yeah, we have a conservative worldview, but, but like I said, we're interested in a, telling a great story and our worldview comes through no matter what. So no, we don't, we don't set out to make a conservative movie, but sadly in today's world, it's labeled that way be, only because it's so, it's so marginalized that our conservatives are so marginalized, not only in Hollywood, but in, in movies and such. And so that's one, one quick way of being able to, 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 you know, as, as Hollywood goes woke and more and more and more of these movies and series coming out, they're just woke leftist garbage and people are getting fed up with it. They want to know kind of up front, you know, I need some movies that, that aren't that woke garbage, you know, well, they know conservatives aren't going to be so, okay, this is a conservative movie. You know what I'm saying? So that's kind of how I see it. I, no, we didn't, we didn't, um, like I said, we humanized, if, if we would have made this a uh, hardcore political hit piece, you know, we wouldn't, we would have demonized Joe and, and Hunter and, and the left wouldn't have said, wow, they make them look, they don't make them look all that bad, you know? So I don't know, you know, it's a good story, but it definitely has a viewpoint, uh, a worldview and um, yeah, it happens to be conservative, but I, I don't know. I don't, I don't think, I don't think that should be a problem. Yeah, I mean, I think with my son Hunter, um, you know, it's dealing with a hot button political issue, and it's inevitably going to uh, get an ideological response, a kind of a knee jerk ideological response, one way or the other. But you, as you pointed out earlier, you just sought for the humanity in the characters. And I think that's the conservative element of it, or that's the good storytelling element that's going to. Uh, get people past the ideologies and past the politics. Um, but conservatives, you know, we have the, we have all the good stories anyway. <laughs> yeah, we, we, really, I mean, really, we really do. And they steal ours and rape them, you know, like, like they do with the Bible stories, right? You know, the Noah movie and the Moses movie, you know, they rape them and atheists make them. Well, yeah, it's the same thing. So yeah, but you know what? I'm okay with the, I'm okay with the, um, uh, with the label because Christian movies have the same problem, you know, and, and that is that it's, it's m very specific material to a specific audience. But you know, if you just think of it as genres, then it shouldn't be a problem. Like there are horror movies. They, they are a genre. The audience expects certain things from horror movies that they get over and over and over again. You know, they go to the various genres because that's what they want, you know? And um, so it's okay if there's a cons Christian movie genre and a conservative movie genre. The problem just comes when you start to have to enforce rules about what these movies can and can't have, it th have in them, you know? For instance, um, you know, our movie, it, you know, it is for a more conservative, like we're not fooling ourselves. We know that leftists don't want to hear other sides or other viewpoints, right? But, so, so our dominant audience is going to be conservative, but we're telling the story about a very profoundly perverse life, you know, of Hunter, Hunter Biden, like I said, all the drugs and sex and all that stuff. And if you don't depict that accurately, the true irony, the true damage, the true evil of everything won't come through. And so to a certain degree, you have to show some of that stuff. Well, sometimes conservatives can be a, a little bit more, um, you know, reticent about that explicit material. So we tried to pull back on it. But look, if he's going to a strip club, or in this case, it's a dance club and, and um, you know, watching dancers and stuff. So the opening is a, has to show a little bit about that. And uh, the debate is always how much do you show? And, and maybe you could show a little bit less and still make the point. So that's the debate. But we definitely push the envelope in that sense for conservative movies. But I think if people just stick with us and trust us, you know, um, stick with it, the story to the end, you'll, 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 you'll get the point. And the point, um, the point is the thing that the left again misses when they, <laughs> when they say they're making them look good. And, and I felt sorry for Hunter. It's like, yeah, yeah. You want to make in the beginning of a story, like in Wolf of Wall Street, you want to show that they're partying and having a blast, but there's something missing. And over time you start to see the dark underbelly and that the, uh, the fun that the partying that, 
looks on the surface is actually a darkness that is empty and and soulless, right? And our story does that. So yeah, so yeah, it it, it looks like uh, it's a world of fun and stuff to begin with, but it really isn't. You're, the, the way that you humanized him uh, as opposed to demonizing Hunter really, I think, uh, helps make, well, th- that's how you make him a quote-unquote sympathetic character, you know, someone that the audience is going to care about. And if you went straight to the political demonization because you hated your political enemy, uh, the story would be missing that compelling element. It would miss, you know, the element of the, the character of a character that you cared about or, or whose fate you were. Yes. It in. wouldn't be truth. It would be propaganda. And the nature of art is truth, not propaganda. And when you're, when you're doing good art, what you do is every, every piece of art does have a, a, per, uh, a view, a viewpoint, a perspective, no doubt, but the more, the better art is able to show both sides, allow both sides of an issue, so to speak, to, to have their best voice, in, in, in the story, it's, you know, understanding that the, uh, people are not cardboard villains. Everybody who's a villain actually in real life thinks they're a hero, right? Thinks they're a good person. They always think or deceive themselves into thinking they're doing good in some way, right? And so, for example, you know, Hunter would be, hey, I'm, I'm helping my family, you know? So, so therefore, that justifies, the left does this all the time, you know, their personal moral lives are a shambles of perversion, uh, but they justify because they're helping humanity with their policies, right? That kind of a thing. So, so that's sort of what's going on there. But, uh, but that's the nature of, that's the essence of good art, and again, I think that's why the left really hates this because we have that. We we have a um, you know the the humanization is simply being truthful and honest about humanity. Therefore, the evil that he does is not a propaganda that you can just dismiss, right? You know, like I say, you know, I think the best <laughs> the best analogy is the Hitler thing. You know, it's like as soon as they start calling you Hitler, it's like, OK, y- y- you don't listen to them anymore. Right. But they know people are listening to us because we're not calling the Bidens Hitler. We're not calling um, um, Hunter, you know, a uh, qu- um, a <laughs> You know, uh, um, I was going to say a Darth Vader, but actually Darth Vader was more complex, right? That That's what they, and it's funny thing is because like, that's what they want because then they can dis- dismiss it. And that's, what, you know what, I say that because I'm, that's what makes me so proud about this movie is that we, in fact, even some conservatives have been a little disappointed. Like, you know, I think you make him look a little, you're a little bit too sympathetic. And I'm like, no, that's the nature of great storytelling is you, the sympathy is what draws you into the story. But if you watch this movie, and you get to the end of the movie and you still think you're, and you're still sympathetic to Hunter, you're a fool because we show the evil for sure. And it's even deeper and darker than, than it looks on the surface. This isn't just political issues going on. There's, there's connections to genocide. There are connections to, um, to communist, um, uh, military weaponry against the United States. This is, this is a true, true evil. And uh, and we don't let we don't we don't let that go. So that comes through. Speaking of propaganda, you know, the left seems to understand kind of intuitively how important it is to create narratives that will shape uh, our, our shared understanding of the past as a culture. And in, in other words, they, they get the point that the late great Andrew Breitbart always raised, which is that politics flows downstream from culture. So you have someone like Barack Obama, for example, who, when he left office, when he left the White House, he didn't just ride off into the sunset as, as kind of an elder statesman. Uh, he went straight to Netflix to make a, a you know, multi-million dollar deal to produce progressive content for them. So the left totally gets that it's that it all starts with the cultural narratives that they shape. Why why have conservatives 
why do they seem to be so slow to take action in that direction or to, to realize? Yeah. That? Yeah. I, I, in fact, one of the reasons why I've been so grateful to work with Ann and Phelan because they really do know the difference and they've always d- displayed that understanding and they're journalists. So they, they tend to, they tend to lean towards more journalistic sort of approaches, but they understand creativity and, and, and really well. And the problem, yeah. So uh, the way, the way I see it, and, and I've seen this in many, in many situations is conservatives, sad to say, um, they, sometimes they really do fulfill the stereotype of they just care about money. And so when you, when you look at like, if conservatives, uh, you know, we can't get our movies made in Hollywood, maybe a few here and there, you know, the terminal list got made. Um, but, but by and large, we have to do independent movies outside the system. And then that means you have to raise your own money. The problem with that is a lot of you go to the millionaires or the billionaires and they see the the business plan for a movie and it's hot, super high risk. And most movies don't make money. Um, and so consequently, when they, you know, conservatives gripe about, you know, Hollywood and stuff. But then when they get the opportunity to put up the money, they realize, oh, such high risk. They're very reticent to support it because it's, it doesn't have that instant or, uh, you know, assured uh, uh, return that, they, that they're looking for. But whereas the left, though, they want to change the world. So they don't care. They don't care if they lose money. It's like, I don't care. I'm changing the world. And, th- and sometimes they'll, that's how they're even pitching these stuff to each other. It's like, this, this, will, this will change the culture, you know, all that kind of stuff. They're, they're, driven, they're driven more by ideology than by money. Now, of course, everyone's driven by money to a certain degree. But what I'm saying is they still appreciate the value, like you said, they believe in the value of it. And so I even know, I even have friends who've, who've worked on, um, I, I, I won't, I won't name it, but like a big conservative movie and on the subject matter, the one subject matter you would think would, um, would draw all the Christian or all the conservative millionaires and billionaires to get money for it. And, uh, they had, you know, years and then they had to cut the budget in half. They couldn't get the money out of these conservative billionaires about the one, you know, well, it's a, it's a project on Ronald Reagan, you know, and you'd think, well, Ronald Reagan would be the e- easiest thing to raise money for. No, it took them years and they couldn't, couldn't get the full budget for it anyway. And, um, and that's, that's, that's when it really shows up and you go, okay, so, so conservatives really don't believe in culture. They say they do and they complain, but when they, the rubber hits the road, when it's put up money, they, they won't do it. And, uh, that's just sad. I do think things are slightly getting better in that respect. I think our side is starting to catch on. I should say the the, the money men on our side are starting to catch on a little bit. And hopefully with uh, with the involvement of some of these major conservative um, <clears throat> organizations like the Daily Wire or even Breitbart, uh, hopefully that will give, uh, you know, conservatives more of a push to, to have an impact on the culture. And that leads me to, Um, a really difficult question, I think, Uh, but maybe the question about culture, which is that should conservatives be working to quote unquote, retake the culture, or should we be creating a parallel culture of of our own? And by that, I mean, you know, we talk about the culture wars a lot, but it seems pretty obvious that the left won the culture war quite a long time ago. I mean, they, they basically own the entertainment arena and news media and academia. So they they largely own the culture. And I think it seems to me that our side has gone from talking about retaking the culture to creating a parallel one. I've heard several high profile conservatives use that term. Now we don't, they don't even talk about trying to retake the culture. It's just creating a parallel culture of our own. What do you think? Well, I, I never, I never used to want to be a part of it in in the sense of some people can do that. That's fine. And by the way, Christian movies have been in that world, in that space for a long time, you know, because they've always felt out, you know, kicked out of Hollywood, so to speak. But for most of my career, I have pursued, no, I want to work within the, in the system and I want to make Hollywood movies and, you know, the way that we would do that is we would find people of like mind. We would try to get it, package our stories together and, and, um, get them funded. And you try to fly in under the radar, you know, you embed your view, you embed your worldview within your stories. And so, no, it's not explicit, but it's, it's embedded in the moral choices and values of the characters, et cetera, and the story meaning and all that. So we understand that. 
And, uh, you know, we try to fly in under the radar and get distribution and, and, um, but now, but I think in the last couple of few years, for sure, the, as Hollywood has gone more woke and more outwardly fascistic and, you know, so now they're just outwardly racist, outwardly sexist, outwardly, um, uh, Christophobic, you know, and outwardly hateful of anything that's conservative where, where they, they, they don't, you know, they just fire people. They won't work with people because they're conservative just because of what they believe, not even because of anything else. You know, in fact, you, I know many, I've had many examples in my life where, you know, you're, you, you know, you kind of keep a little quiet, but people get to like you. And then they find out you're a Christian or a conservative. You're like, really? But you're cool. What's, I don't get it. You know, cause they're, they're bigots. Hollywood is full of bigots. And so, um, so we would get in and flying under the radar, but I think the, the, the level has been ratcheted up of, of um, what, what would be the word, just oppression in Hollywood against conservative viewpoints that the only way we can get movies made are outside the system. So now I've accepted the parallel system only out of necessity. I, I mean, I didn't want to, but I couldn't, couldn't get work with those people, you know? And so, um, and, and, you, and that's exactly what Daily Wire did. And, and the lead producer, Dallas Sonye, you know, he's, he's talked about this many times, you know, he was making plenty of movies in Hollywood, but all of a sudden the doors just closed on, on, and he didn't make propaganda at all but the doors were just closing for anyone with a conservative viewpoint. And so that's why he sort of decided to just let go and come back home and then also just embrace the daily wire paradigm and, and do the parallel economy. And I've, I'm doing the same. I'm like, okay, if that's, I'll make movies wherever I can make movies. If I can't make them over here, I'll make them over there. And that's fine. And it, no, it's not my ideal, but if you have to do it, you have to do it. Right. And the irony of it is, is of course that there's, there should be a massive market for it because people do want movies that at least express their own values. Right. And daily wire gets that. And I, I respect those guys so much, you know, they, they, they understand that and they're trying to create that system. But the problem is, is to create that system involves not just making movies, which is also a complex tangle of so many things that are almost impossible to get made right but the distribution is the bigger and then the marketing and that's all big money you know if you i i know guys who have been trying to do this for years trying to put together like a distribution like a netflix but with a conservative approach or whatever and you know it's like billions or so to or at least hundreds of millions, not billions, hundreds of millions to get these things together because of the infrastructure of distribution even even with you know, online viewing, because the fact that you can view something online, yeah, it's great, but you still, you still can't get the word out. You got to be able to get the word out. You got to have the audience. And by the way, that's one of the reasons why we went with Breitbart.com to distribute My Son Hunter was because they do already have that huge audience of conservatives who, who would take well to our particular movie. And um, Ann and Phelim have released movies on their own. Like they released the Gosnell, you know, but it is really difficult for little guys to get your movies out there and to get the word out. It's just really impossible. It's, it's horrible. The, <laughs> the, the, um, the amount of work and stuff, but if you've already got a built in audience and that's what Breitbart has. And so, and since Breitbart never has done this before, um, still we thought, well, that's better than going out on their own. If they were to just put this movie on their own online, it's like, yeah, the word would get out, but not not with the the push that you have behind Breitbart. So it's all those factors that make you. It's so easy to just say, "Well, just start your own distribution." No, no, you need tens of millions or hundred millions, you know. So, and and I think part of it is also awakening a conservative audience to the to the possibilities of a conservative. Uh, culture or a par parallel culture, because I think so many conservatives have just been put off by the entertainment industry. They they've kind of turned their back on pop culture because they're they're so sick of being sucker punched with political messaging, with leftist messaging, or or having their values just completely blatantly trashed. So I think a lot of conservatives have just kind of turned their back on pop culture when really we you know they need to be awakened to the the, the possibilities 
of great great storytelling that uh, conservatives Absolutely. can offer. And when when I say uh, conservative, when, I, when I'm willing to accept the label of conservative, it's like no, it's we don't make movies where like, people walk around. I'm a conservative. I'm a Republican. I'm a this. You know, it's like no, no, no. It's just the values that and choices. Like like just making a movie where marriage is a positive thing between a man and a woman, that itself would make a great movie and a great story, but it's also conservative. That's all. And that's what Daily Wire is trying to do. They're not, they're not going out and doing, like, I don't think they want to do something as political as My Son Hunter even. Like, they're trying to just make, you know, whether or not you agree with that, it's their, their tack is, we want to do movies where the values and choices are conservative because that, that's the audience that's being lost where you've got, you know, Every Hollywood movie now has to have gay characters and trans characters and gay plots and trans plots, and you've got to be positive and all this stuff about it. And so people are like, many conservatives just don't want to watch that garbage anymore. And so Daily Wire is just, that's what they're trying to provide. Okay, we're going to provide it. We've just got positive family role models or whatever. And uh, they're not even being very political about it. Now, they may, they may go a little bit more political if, you know, like they, they say, if there's a great movie, you know, um, that's, uh, but it's political, you know, we'll do it, but, uh, they're not, they're not, they're trying to avoid that in some ways, you know, but there's other, there's other ways, you know, like our, our movies, Hey, I'm I'm not afraid to be political. I'm not going to do something just to be political, but if it's a political story and it's entertaining and interesting, like my son Hunter, heck yeah, I'll do that. And that, that was a, it was one of the most fascinating stories I ever wrote, you know? And, and what's interesting is that, uh, conservative sto- stories about, I guess we could say normal life experiences, those have become countercultural. <laughs> I mean, the, you know, the the main culture now is so transgressive. It's so focused on pushing the envelope of everything normal um, that if you, if you have a movie that, that features a happily married couple, or of course I know you need drama and tension in a story. So not everybody can be completely happy, but I mean, uh, just normal standards of behavior have become so transgressive that we're the counterculture now. We're, you know, we're the ones who are, are sticking it to the man. Um, and you also, a, a while ago, you had anticipated a question I had about being a conservative in Hollywood. Um, and you say that it's, that it's getting worse. You know, progressives have always kind of claimed that that was a myth, that there's no blacklisting of conservatives in Hollywood. And uh, so it sounds like you think it's it's actually getting worse as Hollywood becomes more woke. Oh yeah, yeah. That's why we left. I mean, I'd been there for 30 years. 30 years. And you know, my vision was to make movies and stuff and um but around the time of the 2020, I I just realized that uh, there's no more work for me here anymore. I can't get work, you know, and um and and you know, my wife and I never wanted to retire in L, uh, in California because it's so expensive, but um so we thought, well, why wait any longer? Now's the time, you know? And uh, yeah, so it's it's just so many things are happening where, you know, you're going to have a script and there's examples of this all over the place. You know, it's, you get, you hand your script in and you can have your subtle world viewpoint in there, but they're going to spot it because they, they know storytelling too. And they're going to say, well, change this and make it pro gay or make it pro trans you know, um, and they're doing that. I mean, they, that's literally what they're doing to scripts and they're demanding and they have all these demands on, on what scripts have to be. And they're all woke demands. So, yeah. So, so that's when I realized, okay, there might be some people who are, who already have power in Hollywood, but if you, if you don't have power, it's going to be almost impossible to get a good movie made without having to subject yourself to that. And and, and as conservatives, uh, as conservatives, hopefully gather some momentum in terms of culture creation and and hollywood by contrast gets more and more woke and 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 has to work harder and harder to tick off all of its identity politics boxes do you think hollywood is uh, is just going to implode in terms of of its own heavy messaging and and shooting themselves in the foot in terms of storytelling i think i see that happening already i th- i think they're even putting off some progressive audiences who because even progressives are bored with heavy handed political messaging. I mean, even, even progressives want to be entertained with a good story, whether or not they, um, they realize it, but you think Hollywood is just, uh, it's beginning to, (laughs) to crash and burn 
under the weight of its own politics? I mean, to a certain degree, yeah. But, but you know, I don't necessarily believe go woke, go broke. It does happen in, in, in certain circumstances. But ultimately, the culture is changing and becoming accepting, right? And so, for instance, just the whole trans delusion, like in, in, in schools, you know, and, and propagandizing children. And now, you know, the percentage of children who think of themselves as trans, it's just, it's frightening, which just goes to show that it does work over time. You do get reactions like, you know, Nike goes woke and then they have a dip, but then the money comes back over time or, you know, Hollywood, you know, like uh, Disney, they get, you know, people, uh, I can't remember what the latest controversy with them was, but some woke thing. And so they lose subscriptions. Net- Netflix lost like hundreds of millions of dollars. And then they pulled back on their um, um, uh, censorship. They were you know, starting to censor. And then they allowed these uh, anti-woke comedians to continue to do their, their videos. And they told their woke employees, like, well, if you don't like this, then maybe you should work somewhere else. So there's some degree that that pushback occurs, but but the, but you have to realize this is the long march through the institutions of of culture. It's still it's coming because people are changing, and the more people change and become more woke, then they're going to want woke material. So it could still destroy the. It's going to destroy the culture and destroy the the entire country. Um, who knows what kind of violence it will end in? But uh, in the meantime, it does work. Even if people react here and there, it's working because it is persuading a lot of people and people are believing these bizarre delusionary things that you would go, well, that's conspiracy theories or that's, you know, delu- that's anti-science and people are believing all this stuff because it does work, you know, sadly. Yeah. And I think that's all the more reason why conservatives have to to consider creating this parallel culture, regardless of all the growing pains and and uh, difficulties getting things done because we'll gather some momentum. But, but I think in terms of saving the culture, we have to let part of it just collapse under the weight of its own uh, wokeness. And, and we have to, uh, we have to um, keep the light alive, (laughs) keep the light of our culture alive and civilization alive. Yeah. You know, in some ways though, it's like, so, so what I think is going to happen is when you, when you become too extreme so soon, people do react. So they're going to pull back and they'll learn to make it more subtle. And that's where it's more dangerous because that's, that's, you know, where you start, you stop pushing it on people and making it loud. You just embed it and just, you know, as subtle as possible, then they'll, they'll relearn that lesson. Cause that's, you know, that's the nature of movies. You know um, they do respond to audiences to some degree, you know um, but not fully because they also push the envelope and that pushes the audience to then sort of, change and the culture changes over time. So, but you're right. I definitely think we need to be fighting to the end and uh, fighting to the last man and, and still be seeking to, you know, regardless of what Hollywood is doing, regardless of the fact that these major institutions, not just Hollywood, the government has all been captured by this far left wing extremism. Um, we've got to keep fighting, even if we don't think we can win because we can win and it just takes generations though. And we have to, we have to build our families and prepare them to be the fighters of the future as well. And, uh, that's, that, that's just how it works. So yeah, I'm not going to sit and just complain. I'm going to keep telling my stories and just trying to find new avenues to do so. And I've, and, and by the way, that's what, that's what I've done with my novels. You know, I've realized that I can make a good living writing my novels and get more of my stories out there than I ever did with movies. So, um, I've been writing, you know, novels as well as movies now. So That sounds like a great place to stop. Brian Godawa, thank you so much for your time and insights today. Thanks for coming on the Right Take podcast. And please keep up the great work. Keep bringing us great stories. Thanks a lot, Mark. Thanks for having me. My pleasure, man. Thank you. The Right Take with Mark Tapson is a project of the David Horowitz Freedom Center and Front Page Magazine. Unauthorized reproduction of this podcast without express written consent is prohibited.